every one of our campuses, I want to say hello and welcome wherever you happen to be listening right now. One of our campuses online, I'm grateful, we're grateful together that we get to be together for week four of our Miracle of Mercy campaign. This week, we're going to focus on the truth that mercy forgives. This amazing, awesome truth, this life-changing truth. What we're gonna talk about the next few moments is at the very basics of what it means to know who Jesus is, but it's also the very best of what it means to know who Jesus is. It's something that changes everything about you, everything about your life, everything about your direction. Jesus talked about it in his prayer that we call the Lord's Prayer, Matthew 6, 12. He said, I want you to pray like this. Forgive us our sins as we have forgiven those who sin against us. And in that simple prayer he taught us, he reminds us that the mercy of forgiveness brings freedom in two specific ways. It brings freedom when I can say to God, God, forgive me. And it brings freedom when I can say to you, I forgive you. I forgive you. And we're going to talk about those two specific ways that forgiveness brings freedom in these next few minutes together. Now, remember that the definition of mercy that we're looking at together these weeks is that mercy is undeserved forgiveness and unearned kindness. And just like I need God's undeserved forgiveness, unearned kindness in my life, also others need God's undeserved forgiveness, undeserved kindness, but they also need sometimes our undeserved forgiveness and kindness as we share mercy, as we share forgiveness towards other people. So let's get right into this. How does this apply to what God wants to do in my life, and how does it apply to what I can do in other people's lives? Two simple truths. No, truth number one is mercy means God forgives me. God forgives me. Now that, God forgives me, God forgives you, that is the greatest good news ever. God is willing to wipe your slate entirely clean. God is willing to give you a fresh start. God is willing to remove your debt. God is willing to set you free. That is good news. That is better than a $10 billion inheritance because it's about you and who you are, not just about money. That is better than a cure for every disease on planet Earth and perfect peace on planet Earth because this is good news that lasts forever. This, this is the goodest good news that's ever been gooded. That's how good this good news is. But if you've been in church for any amount of time, you know there's a problem. You know there's a problem with this good news, and that is we get used to it. It doesn't feel as good as it used to feel because we just sort of get used to how good this good news really is. We have this sense of, oh yeah, yeah, I already knew that. Can we talk about something I don't know yet because I want to know something different? But the truth is, unless I live here understanding God's forgiveness of me, it doesn't matter how much I know. This is where the life really is. Forgiveness is not merely some theological fact. It is a personal gift. It's a personal gift to rejoice in every day of our lives. Now, to get to what I'm talking about here, let me just ask you a question. Do you feel forgiven? I'm not asking whether you know you're forgiven. I'm asking, do you feel forgiven? Now, I know that forgiveness is a fact, whether you feel it or not. I totally understand that. But it bothers me. That as I talk to people, not enough people feel forgiven. And here's why it bothers me. You do feel guilty. You feel guilty. And if you feel guilty but don't feel forgiven, something is wrong. You often hear people say, I just feel so guilty. Have you ever heard anybody say, I just feel so forgiven today? You just don't hear that. People don't talk that way. We should talk that way because forgiveness it's not just an emotion. It's this genuine experience of God's forgiveness that should sink deeply into our heart. And somewhere along the way, if it really sinks in, something happens. I start to feel forgiven. When you feel guilty, it actually draws you away from God usually. Because who wants to be close to the one that's making you feel guilty? This happens in your family, too. Feel guilty about something you've done to somebody, haven't talked about it yet, you just sort of stay away for a little while. You don't want to be close to the one that makes you feel guilty. But when you feel forgiven, it draws you closer to God because you recognize what he has given into our lives, what he has gifted into our lives. So I want to talk just for a few moments about what God has done when he's forgiven us. And as I talk about this, these are actually four truths to help you to feel forgiven, to feel the truth of your forgiveness. Four simple truths. And as I talk through these, I want to invite you with me 
to not just hear them, but with me to, to feel them. Number one, truth number one is God wants to forgive me. God wants to forgive me. One of the ways to feel forgiven is to realize how God feels about forgiving you. And he wants to forgive you. He's not begrudging about it. It's not like he, well, I have to, I guess, because of what Jesus did. That's the one person I would not want to forgive, but I'll do it anyway. No, he wants to forgive you. Many, many, many verses about this in the Bible. Nehemiah 9, 17 is one of them. You are a God of forgiveness, always ready to pardon, gracious and merciful and slow to become angry and full of love and mercy. You might circle that phrase, always ready. God is not reluctant to forgive. He wants to forgive you. He enjoys forgiving you. He's full of love and mercy. He has all the capacity he needs to forgive you. That's how he feels about it. Micah 7, 18, one of my favorite verses says, you do not stay angry forever, but listen to this. You delight to show mercy. God delights in showing mercy. It's one of his favorite things to do. Giving forgiveness makes God's day. That's how he feels about it. He wants to do this in your life. Now, just for a minute, think with me. What is it that brings you delight? Maybe when you were a kid, it was going to Disneyland. Something that brings you delight is something you would look forward to, and then afterwards you would enjoy the fact that you'd been able to do it. Something that brings you delight. Now that you're older, maybe it's some vacation spot. You look forward to going there, and after you go there, you've got albums of pictures, or you've got pictures on your uh, phone that you're going through again and again and again, just enjoying what happened. You delighted in it. That's the way that God feels, experiences your forgiveness. God looked forward to forgiving you. In fact, the Bible says he looked forward to forgiving you before time even began. That's how long he looked forward to forgiving you. That's how God feels about it. He wants to forgive you. And God, if he had a picture album up in heaven or he had a phone up in heaven, you can decide whether it's iPhone or Android. You guys can have that argument somewhere else. If he had a phone up in heaven, he'd be going through pictures of the day he forgave you. That was a great day. That was a great day. That was a great day. Because God wants to forgiving you, to forgive you. He, he delights in forgiving you. That's truth number one, to help you and I to feel the forgiveness that God gives to us. Truth number two is this: God freely forgives me. God freely forgives me. It's not as if there is something I must do to earn His forgiveness. He gives it to me freely, he gives it to me as a gift. Romans 3:23 and 24 talks about this. All of us have sinned. We all know the first part of that verse. Not everybody knows the second part of this. Yet now, God declares us not guilty of offending him if we trust in Jesus Christ, who freely takes away all of our sins. You might circle that word freely. This reminds us that you will never earn or deserve God's forgiveness. You can't. It's a gift. It's free to us, but the cost, remember, was very high. The cost was Jesus Christ giving his life on the cross. He gave his all for us so he could give forgiveness to us. That's the gift that he's given. For us, forgiveness is free. It is freely given. And when you freely trust, God freely gives. So because you're human, forgiveness is your greatest need. And because Christ died for you, forgiveness can be God's greatest gift given into your life. So, so you look at this, a gift freely given. I, I can be forgiven, my, my slate entirely wiped clean. What in the world would keep me from receiving that kind of a gift? And there could be a lot of answers. I think the top two are this. One is, I just don't believe it. It just seems too good to be true. Even though billions of people's, people have seen their lives changed by this truth, for you somehow, anything that's too good to be true can't be true. And usually that is true in this world. But not with the cross that moment that changed history, not with the love of Jesus Christ. He truly loves you that much. So sometimes it's because you just can't believe it, but I think maybe more often it's because people feel like, I just don't deserve it. Maybe other people deserve it, but I don't deserve it. And you'd say, you don't know the story of my life. I mean, I'm sitting here in church with all these nice church people. If they just knew the story of my life, you'd know that I was the person that could not be forgiven. I just want to tell you, if you're feeling that way, the people you're sitting with, they're not that nice. They're not nearly as nice as you think. 
The truth of the matter is the man or woman that you're sitting by, they've got their own story. The truth of the matter is we've all got stuff in our lives. So I just thought for the next five minutes we'd all tell the ways that we haven't been nice, the stories. And <laughs> that laughter tells you how not nice we are, the fact that we laughed just then. We all have our struggles. None of us deserve forgiveness. Not one of us. It is an undeserved free gift. Now, if you're not sure if you're forgiven, it's a gift you can accept right now because it's freely given. It's not one you have to wait to receive by earning it or doing this or coming to church a certain number of times. God will give it to you right now. If you're not certain that you're forgiven, your slate is wiped clean because of what Jesus did for you on the cross, you can accept the gift right now just by telling him you want that gift in prayer. You don't even have to close your eyes, just in your mind right now. You can pray in your mind and say to God right now, God, I accept that gift. I'm not sure if I've ever accepted it before, ever told you. So I'm telling you right now, I accept that gift of your forgiveness. Thank you for freely giving me what I could not earn on my own. Now, when you do that, everything changes. You don't necessarily feel it right away. You might have, but everything changes. Because when you accept what is freely given, then God sets you free. Look at this verse that's up on the screen. Colossians 1.14 says, In him we enjoy our freedom, the forgiveness of sin. So as we talk about feeling your forgiveness, one of the ways to feel it is to enjoy this freedom that this verse is talking about. How do you enjoy the freedom that comes into your life because of forgiveness? Are you enjoying it? You can stop trying to pay the price for the wrong things that you've done. Make up for it on your own. And you can enjoy the freedom of your forgiveness. That's what this is talking about. You can stop letting shame and guilt push you into their mold. And you can begin to allow forgiveness to invite you into an entirely new kind of life, a freedom in life. You can enjoy your freedom. You can stop feeling judged by God and by others and enjoy the freedom of your forgiveness. You can stop being haunted by some mistake in your past and begin to enjoy the freedom of your forgiveness. Here's how it works. In freedom, God takes your shame, your guilt, and your fear and he replaces it. He replaces it with his peace, with his grace, and with his love. That's the exchange that he makes. That's the freedom that he gives. That's what it means to be freely given forgiveness. God wants to forgive you. God freely forgives you. And then a third truth that helps you and I to feel the fact that we're forgiven is God immediately forgives me. He doesn't wait. He immediately forgives me. It's not like God's sitting up in heaven and going, well, that sin, that was a particularly bad sin on my list of sins. I'm going to make you wait a while for this one. Like maybe next week. Get back to me Wednesday, 3 o'clock. I'll forgive you then. No, he immediately forgives because forgiveness is based on what Jesus did on the cross. It's already done. It's already settled. Any sin that you commit, any sin that I commit, it's already settled. He said, I will forgive. He doesn't ever say, I'll think about it. He already thought about it, and he already decided to forgive you. He already showed you he decided to forgive you by having Jesus die on the cross for you. It is settled the moment you ask. Isaiah 55, verse 7 says, let's read this one together. God is merciful and quick to forgive. Not slow, but quick. So we've been talking about guilt and forgiveness. Once you've begun to follow Jesus Christ, once you've accepted the forgiveness that only he can give into your life, should you ever feel guilty? Well, I'd say yes, maybe for about a second and a half, as long as it takes to recognize that he's forgiven you. Because guilt is actually like a, a warning light on your dashboard. The computer screen pops up or the light pops up and says something is wrong. And guilt says something is wrong. But when you see that light, you don't just sit there and stare at the light. Oh, no, something's wrong. No, you get out and you fix whatever is wrong. When you see the warning light of guilt, don't stare at the light. That's what Satan wants you to do. He wants you just to sit there and feel guilty and more guilty and more guilty. Nothing's going to get solved that way. It's a warning light that says, look at the cross. Look at what Jesus did for you. Look at the love that he has for you. So every time you feel guilty, you immediately look at the cross of Christ and remember 
the love that he has for you, the forgiveness that he's given to you. He immediately forgives, immediately. There's a myth out there that feeling guilty makes you better. It does not. It, doesn't, it just makes you miserable, it makes everybody around you miserable. The truth is grace makes you better. Grace makes you grow. Guilt should only be used as a warning light to look at the forgiveness in Jesus Christ. So God immediately forgives me. And then there's a fourth truth to get a hold of, to understand that you and I can feel the forgiveness that's a fact in our lives. And that is the truth that God completely forgives me. Completely. He, he doesn't forgive just a part of the sin. He doesn't di- forgive just a part of you. He completely forgives you. Colossians 2, 13 and 14 say this, says this very dramatically. God forgave all our sins. He canceled the record that contained the charges against us. He took it and he destroyed it by nailing it to the cross. That's about as clear as you can get. Look, he canceled the record. He completely annulled it. It's as if it never happened. How long do you remember a paid bill? Not for one moment. It's already canceled. It's already done. He completely destroyed it by nailing it to the cross. He destroyed it. God doesn't take your sins and file them away in some locked file drawer for future use, just in case you get out of line sometime. No, he completely destroys the record. He takes it and he shreds it. And then he incinerates what he's shredded. And then he atomizes what he's incinerated. Whatever your CSI mind needs to go through and realize there is no evidence left, go to that place, because that's what he's done. There is no evidence left in the mind of God because he's completely wiped it out. The problem is, you and I, we struggle with this because we don't recognize how completely God has forgiven us. And so we find ourselves not forgiving ourselves when God has completely forgiven us. Not recognizing Micah 7, 19, this simple truth. You will have mercy on us again. You will conquer our sins. You will throw away all of our sins into the deepest part of the sea. God has completely forgiven it. If God has completely forgiven it, shouldn't you completely forgive yourself, completely recognize that forgiveness in your life? The problem is, here's where you see that you're struggling with this. If you don't accept the fact that God has completely forgiven your sin, anytime something goes wrong in your life, you're gonna think, God's getting me. God's getting me for what I did here. God's getting me for what I did there. And the truth of the matter is, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. The truth of the matter is, God has completely forgiven it. The truth of the matter is, we're all gonna face good and bad times on this earth. And the idea that God is punishing you for what you did is completely opposite to this truth. God has completely forgiven you. He wants to be close to you. He wants you to be close to him. The most, we're talking about the most basic truth of knowing Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ paid for your sins on the cross. You are forgiven. As I'm talking through this, you may be starting to feel, you may have been feeling from the very beginning, you know, this, this just doesn't seem right. It's just too good to be true. How could this be right? If you're feeling that way, that's actually the right way to feel. It, it, it isn't right. This is not about justice. It's about forgiveness. It's about love. It's about an undeserved gift. God chose to show you mercy because he loves you. Not because it was the right thing to do, but because he loves you. When when you feel forgiven, you feel loved. You recognize how loved you really are. You recognize the truth of this verse that we've been looking at throughout these weeks at looking at God's mercy. The truth of James 2, verse 13. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Mercy wins. Mercy wins. Maybe this is a good place to stop because we could just leave, go home right now, get home a little bit early, sense and feel God's forgiveness, and not deal with the next hard truth that we have to look at. But if we didn't look at this hard truth, if we didn't look at this hard truth, we'd be missing out on the truth of what forgiveness can really do in our lives, on the power of forgiveness in our lives. Because not only does mercy mean that God forgives me, mercy means I forgive others. And that's tough. That can be a struggle. I know you have been hurt. And I know as we talk about this, that the depth of hurt that some of you have faced. So what we're talking about is not easy. 
So I'm gonna assume that we all struggle to forgive in one way or another. And I wanna talk about how God helps us in our struggle to forgive. How God helps us in this struggle that we have to forgive in our lives. I found that the struggle is for a couple of reasons usually, this struggle to forgive. First reason, foremost, is I'm gonna to struggle to forgive if I haven't been forgiven by God. If I haven't been forgiven, I don't have anything to pass along, I don't have anything to give out of. So until I have been forgiven, of course I can't forgive. Or if I don't feel forgiven, I don't want you to feel forgiven, so I'm, I'm gonna struggle. And that's where some of us are struggling, but not most of us. I've found that for most of us, the place that we struggle is we've been given some misunderstandings about forgiveness. There's this Christian urban myth culture out there about what forgiveness really is. In fact, just to get a sense of what that is, there's a quiz in your, uh, on, your, on your outline. Go ahead and pull that out. And what I want you to do just real quickly is just walk through this and circle true or false on each of these. The quiz is a person should not be forgiven until he or she asks for it. Just circle, true or false there. You haven't really forgiven until you've forgotten the offense, true or false. Forgiving includes minimizing the offense and the pain caused. What do you think, true or false? Forgiveness includes restoring trust and reuniting a relationship. Circle one of those. When I see someone else hurt, it's my duty to forgive the offender, true or false. Now, the truth is, they're all false. Every one of those is false. And I wanna spend a few moments just talking through that, showing you what the Bible teaches about that. What does the Bible teach about forgiveness? It teaches that all of those are false. For instance, the last one. If I see somebody else hurt, it's not my duty to forgive. I forgive the offenses that are done against me. I don't go around indiscriminately saying, oh, I forgive you for what you did to her. I forgive you for what you did to him. That's sort of a Messiah complex. Jesus is the one who forgives like that. No, I forgive when I've been hurt. I don't forgive. In fact, it actually takes the forgiveness out of the other person's hands. It's their responsibility and their privilege to forgive in that moment. You don't invade that moment. But sometimes we think, well, am I supposed to forgive anything and everything? No, I forgive when I've been hurt. There's other truths here to take a look at. So let's just walk through some of what the Bible teaches about this when it comes to you and I forgiving others. The Bible teaches that forgiveness, my forgiveness of others, is not conditional. It's not conditional. It is not conditioned on them asking. It's not conditioned on them earning it. The Bible says in Ephesians 4.32, forgive one another as quickly and thoroughly as God in Christ has forgiven you. That's how you forgive. That's the kind of forgiveness that you have. That's the power of God's forgiveness in our lives. People do not have to earn your forgiveness any more than you had to earn God's forgiveness. And if you wait for somebody to ask for your forgiveness, <laughs> for one thing, there's some people who hold that over your head. They'll know that they're hurting you as long as they're making you wait, so they'll just make you wait longer. So you don't wait. You just mess up their plan and you just forgive them immediately, God, like God forgave you immediately. That's the kind of spirit that you have. The Bible teaches that we have unconditional forgiveness towards others. It's not conditioned on anything. When I was first starting to follow Jesus Christ, there was a story about this that deeply affected me, deeply impacted me. And I'd like to take a minute to share it with you. There's a story of a woman named Corey Ten Boom that some of you may have heard of who had been put in a Nazi concentration camp as a Christian because her family had housed Jews in Holland and had suffered, seen her, seen her sister die, eventually been released, and after her release began to go around and share with people the forgiveness of God, God even in the midst of the horrors that she had faced. She writes this experience that she had of forgiveness. It was in a church in Munich that I saw him, a balding, heavy-set man in a gray overcoat, a brown felt hat clutched between his hands. People were filing out of the basement room where I had just spoken. It was 1947, and I had come from Holland to defeated Germany with the message that God forgives. And that's when I saw him, working his way forward against the others. One moment I saw the overcoat and the brown hat, the next, a blue uniform and a visored cap with its skull and crossbones. It came back with a rush. The huge room at the concentration camp called Ravensbrück 
with its harsh overhead lights, the pathetic pile of dresses and shoes in the center of the floor, the shame of walking naked past this man. The man who was making his way forward had been a guard, one of the most cruel guards. And now he was in front of me, a hand thrust out, a fine message, Fraulein. How good it is to know that, as you say, all our sins are at the bottom of the sea. And I, who had spoken so glibly of forgiveness, fumbled in my pocketbook rather than take that hand. He would not remember me, of course. How could he remember one prisoner from among thousands of women? But I remembered him and the leather crop swinging from his belt. I was face to face with one of my captors, and my blood seemed to freeze. You mentioned Ravensbrook in your talk, he was saying. I was a guard there. No, he did not remember me. But since that time, he went on, I have become a Christian. I know that God has forgiven me for the cruel things that I did there. But I would like to hear it from your lips as well, Fraulein. And again, the hand came out, will you forgive me? And I stood there, I whose sins had again and again to be forgiven, and I could not forgive. My sister Betsy had died in that place. Could he erase her slow, terrible death simply for the asking? It could not have been many seconds that he stood there, hand held out, but to me it seemed hours as I wrestled with the most difficult thing I'd ever had to do. For I had to do it. I knew that. I knew it not only as a commandment of God, but as a daily experience. Since the war, I had had, had a home in Holland for victims of Nazi brutality. And those who were able to forgive their former enemies were able also to return to the outside world and rebuild their lives, no matter what their physical scars. Those who nursed their bitterness remained invalids. It was as simple and horrible as that. And still I stood there with the coldness clutching my heart. But forgiveness is not an emotion. I knew that too. Forgiveness is an act of the will, and the will can function regardless of the temperature of the heart. Jesus, help me, I prayed silently. I can lift my hand. I can do that much. You supply the feeling. And so woodenly, mechanically, I thrust my hand into the one stretched out to me. And as I did, an incredible thing took place. The current started in my shoulder, it raced down my arm, it sprang into our joined hands. And then this healing warmth seemed to flood my whole being, bringing tears to my eyes. I forgive you, brother, I cried with all my heart. For a long moment, we grasped each other's hands, the former guard and the former prisoner. I had never known God's love so intensely as I did then. You see how that's the kind of story that hits your heart. But my question is, what do we do with that kind of a story? How do we handle that kind of a story? One way to handle it is to feel pretty guilty. Because the truth of the matter is, whatever was done to me this last week, I'm having a hard time forgiving that thing that the person said about me at the office. And now, here's somebody who's able to forgive what happened in a Nazi concentration camp. I can start to feel pretty guilty, and that's the wrong direction to take. Because if I feel guilty and that makes me forgive, it's gonna last, forgiveness is gonna last as long as that feeling of guilt lasts. No, the, the truth here, the truth that I take from this is that God is able to give the grace to forgive no matter how I've been hurt. And he gives it to the person who's been hurt. He doesn't give it to me. He gives it to you who've been hurt. He is willing to give that grace. He's willing to give that grace. God, when I recognize that kind of forgiveness, God is able to work something into my life and heart that has a power of freedom that I may not have imagined before this in my life. So forgiveness is unconditional. There's some other truths that we need to get a hold of here. And the second truth, I think, is the one that people are the most confused about. And that is, forgiveness is not forgetting. To forgive, we say, well, forgive and forget. How do you forget? Your brain still remembers it. How do you forgive and forget? That's impossible for the human brain. So forgiveness is not forgetting. 
Let me show you some of the little known verses about forgiveness in the Bible. We just read the Apostle Paul telling us to forgive no matter what the circumstances. Let me read you what he had to say in a letter to, the book, letter to Timothy, 2 Timothy 4. Paul writes, Alexander the metal worker did me a great deal of harm. The Lord will repay him for what he's done. You too should be on your guard against him because he strongly opposed our message. Now, here's Paul, who we just read in Ephesians 4 saying, forgive no matter the circumstance. Here's Paul saying, this guy did me a lot of harm. Watch out for that guy. I hope God repays him. I like this Paul, don't you? I feel more comfortable with this Paul. I can, I can live with that. It's a reminder of what real forgiveness is all about. There is this Christian myth out there that genuine forgiveness means you have somehow forgotten it or that it doesn't hurt anymore. <laughs> if it's a deep enough wound, of course it still hurts. Forgiving does not mean forgetting. It means, notice what he says, the Lord will repay him. I believe that Paul forgave him. I believe he followed his own advice, his own Holy Spirit inspired advice in other places in scripture. But I also believe that he didn't forget it. And he's able to say, okay, I've handed it over to God, God's gonna repay him. I'm not, I'm not hanging on to it anymore. I've handed it to God. It's in God's hands now. And that's what you and I do. We hand it over to God. But that doesn't mean you always forget it. Many of you, if you're new to Saddleback, you don't know that many of those who are sitting here right now have been to Rwanda. In 1994, you know that the genocide in Rwanda over 100 days took a million lives. And after that genocide, Rwanda decided as a country that the only way to survive was to forgive because neighbors had killed neighbors. People had killed people in their own communities. So how could they survive? How could they go on? The only way to survive was to decide to forgive. It was forgive or be destroyed. So the theme of that country, an example to the world, is the theme of forgiveness. But they did not forget. Those of you that have been to Rwanda have probably been to the genocide memorial. They did not forget. You can walk through and see what happened. They did not want to forget what happened. They didn't want it to happen again. You can forgive but not forget. If you go by the parliament building in Rwanda, the bullet holes are still in the side of the walls. They didn't want to forget. Right now, month of April, is Kuvika 2016 in Rwanda. Beginning April 7th, the day that the genocide began, and all through the month of April every year, they spend a month of mourning. They don't forget. There's no marriages, there's no weddings that are done during the month of April in Rwanda because it's a month of mourning. They didn't forget. In fact, in some cases, in this case, it would be a sin to forget. So if anybody's told you that forgiveness means that you have to forget it or pretend it never happened, that's absolutely not true. It means you let it go into the hands of God. It means you don't take revenge anymore. It means you put it into his hands and you recognize you can't hold that bitterness in your heart. They don't forget, but they have forgiven. Now, this same verse that we just looked at actually is, is a clue to the next truth that you and I need to remember about forgiveness, the next breaking of one of those urban myths, and that is the truth that forgiveness is not trusting the person again. To forgive doesn't mean you trust the person again. Notice Paul said at the end, be on your guard against him, Timothy Alexander. He didn't trust him because he'd been hurt by him. He didn't trust him. Forgiving and trusting are two different things. You have to forgive the person immediately, the Bible says, because of what it does to your heart to not forgive. But you don't trust them immediately. In fact, in some places, it would be foolish to trust them immediately. They've hurt you. They've hurt others in ways that they can't be trusted yet. Maybe they can prove to be trustworthy one day, but it certainly hasn't happened yet. Last week, we talked together about Jesus fixing a breakfast for Paul, for Peter, who had sinned against him on the beach. And a couple of you asked me going out of church, do I have to fix a breakfast for the people that have hurt me? Here's, here's the answer. You have to forgive them, but no, you don't have to fix them breakfast. Not yet, at least. You do not have to fix them breakfast. You're not Jesus. 
You don't have to fix him breakfast yet. And even with Jesus, Peter had already repented. He'd already begun again to turn his heart and life toward Jesus Christ. So you don't have to fix him breakfast, but I do gotta tell you this. The fact that you've forgiven them might change their heart one day that they become trustworthy and you do find yourself eating breakfast with them once again. I know that's scary to even think about. So let's get off of the eggs and the ham and the bacon and whatever. Of course, for Peter, there was no ham and bacon, but let's get off of the egg. Let's say it that way. And let's instead focus on the fact that the place that we start is just with forgiving. I don't know if you're ever gonna be able to trust them again. I pray that you can. I pray that it changes their heart. But that is up to them and to you both moving forward. What you do immediately is you forgive. You forgive. Now we're gonna talk more about this, this issue of trusting in part two of this message. And part two of this message is actually this week in your small groups. Pastor Rick's gonna be talking about this and how to do it, the steps that you walk through. There's some practical ways to think about this. This is a big enough subject, it takes two parts to really look at it well. If you're not in a small group yet for this campaign, it is not too late. I know I said it's week two, but you can start now. You can catch up very easily. You just go out afterwards and uh, you can pick up the material. You can start your own group. You can join another group. We're gonna talk about some more what it means to forgive, but not yet trust. You forgive immediately. So if forgiveness isn't forgetting, if it's not trusting them again, then what is it? Write this in with me. Forgiveness is Releasing it to God. Forgiveness is releasing it to God. When someone has hurt you, the way you start to heal is by forgiveness, by releasing it back to God. Revenge doesn't work. Repayment doesn't work. Resentment doesn't work. That just keeps the bitterness growing in your life. Unforgiveness creates an emotional undertow in your life. And if you've ever been caught in an undertow, I know some of you have, that current takes you places you do not want to be. And unforgiveness, the current of that in your life, will take you places where you don't want to be. You'll find yourself saying things you didn't want to say, doing things you didn't want to do, being a person you don't want to be. That is the danger of unforgiveness. So you let it go. You release it to God. You trust it into God's hands. When you hold on to a hurt, it turns into a hate. If you don't release a bitterness, you start to resemble that bitterness. You actually start to look like the person you're not forgiving. That's what tends to happen in our lives. So you release it. In the New Testament, there are two Greek words, two words in the language the New Testament was written in for forgiveness, to forgive. One means to offer a gift of grace, and the other means to release or to set free. And you actually do both. You offer somebody this gift of grace. You release it and you set them free by releasing them into the hands of God. You don't pretend it never happened. You don't say it never happened. You don't say there's never gonna be anything that happens as a consequence because of what they did. No, you put it in God's hands instead of your hands. And when you forgive, it sets you free. When you forgive like this, it often sets others free as well. There is incredible power in forgiveness to change you, to change your family, to change your entire place of work, change your school. There's power in forgiveness to change a nation. There's power in the way that we forgive to change a nation. Last June, the world saw a picture of genuine forgiveness in the most horrific of circumstances through the Emmanuel AME Church in Charleston, South Carolina. You remember, many of you, that that's the church that a young man walked into in a midweek prayer meeting and shot and killed nine people, including the pastor of the church. At the arraignment for this perpetrator, that church showed a kind of genuine forgiveness that captured people's hearts, that changed the direction of the conversation. Nadine Collier, whose mother was killed, said I, to the one who had killed her mother, I forgive you. You took something very precious away from me. You hurt me. You hurt a lot of people. But God, but if God can forgive you, I forgive you. Their forgiveness so changed things that the Wall Street Journal called it a miracle. 
a modern day miracle. It so changed things that within eight days, the Confederate flag that had been flying over the state capitol, a flag that battles for decades had been made over because of the hurt that was in that flag for so many people. Because of their forgiveness, instead of the battle going on or the battle being intensified, that flag was taken down. And what had taken decades and decades of argument to see no resolution, forgiveness brought resolution in just eight days. That's the power of forgiveness. To change a heart, to change a life, to change a family, to change a company, to change a country. That's the power of what God wants to do in my life, in your life, through choosing to forgive. I've been in church a long time. I've talked to a lot of people about forgiveness. And I've found that when it comes to talking about forgiveness, there's really two kinds of people. There are people who find it easier to forgive. And there are people, guess who the second kind of person is, who find it harder to forgive. And I, I've watched this for a long time. And I, I, I've decided that having a bunch of people who are better at forgiving feeling morally superior to those who struggle to forgive, that's not God's plan. That's just a plan for pride. And have a bunch of people who struggle to forgive feeling judged by those who are better at forgiving, that's not God's plan. Truth of the matter is, if you find it easier to forgive, uh, watching this for a long time, it's usually more a matter of your personality than your spirituality. So stop being prideful about it. And just realize we all struggle with it in some ways. And realize there is this simple truth that we all need to cut through all of the comparing and get to the core of what God wants to do through the power of forgiveness. The simple truth is this. Forgiveness is not something you do. Forgiveness is something that God has done. And so forgiveness, don't miss this. Forgiveness is not a gift that you give. Forgiveness is a gift that God has given and that you just pass on to somebody else. The Bible says this in Colossians 3.13. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. Well, that's what we've just done. We've just done what that verse says to do. We've just remembered that the Lord forgave us. Remembered that we are forgiven. There's the truth of forgiveness, and we need to feel that forgiveness in our lives. And then we've recognized the truth that so we must forgive others. These two truths are always linked. I cannot forgive others without knowing that God has forgiven me. And knowing that God has forgiven me will inevitably lead me to the place of forgiving others. Now, in the end, this is a matter of a conversation with God. Because forgiveness is about what he wants to do in my life and a gift that he wants to give through my life. So I'd like to end just with a brief moment of talking with him together. Would you pray with me? And in prayer, would you just say, God, first, Father, first, thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for the gift of forgiveness. Help me to feel the depth of that gift as I walk through life this week. And then some of you need to pray, God, there's someone I need to forgive. And so, Right now, I release it to you, Lord. I know I don't have to forget it. I know I don't have to trust them again, but I know I need to release it to you to stop being bitter and punishing them in my heart, thinking it's gonna do some good, but instead release those feelings to you, release their judgment to you. For some of you, as you prayed that just now, that's the most courageous prayer you've ever prayed. I know how hard that was. Maybe you couldn't even pray it. Maybe you need to pray, God, I'm not sure I can release it, but I'm willing to be made willing. I need you to show me the way. All of us together, Father, in the end, want to tell you how grateful we are for the cross of Christ, how grateful we are for your forgiveness. Thank you for the truth that sets us free. In your name we praise you. Amen.